Welcome to the Joe Watt Podcast. I'm Joe Vendramini from the University of Florida. And today our guest is Mr. Clint Rollerson. Clint, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me, Joe. Yeah, it's uh, Clint uh, has already participated in the podcast when he was here in South Florida. And I really appreciate he, he being willing to, to be on again. And, and Clint, I will ask you to introduce yourself first, and then we will go through, through our, our conversation here. Okay, my name is Clint Rollerson. I live in western Kansas, a little place called Codell. I work for a company called Next Gen Cattle. I've been here for about two years, and as everybody pretty much knows, I'm from South Florida, fifth generation cowboy rancher from South Florida. And, uh, I'm now kind of moved my uh, talents, or however you want to say it, to Western Kansas and learn how to ranch here. And Clint, I think this brings us to our conversation today that I would like to, to cover. And it is a drastic change between landscape from South Florida to Kansas. So I would like you to please uh, share with us uh, about your experience in this moving to Kansas and what has been some of the different things in this cow-calf production that you found over there. Well, that's exactly it. One thing that intrigued me about this move when I got this opportunity was the chance to move and learn how to ranch somewhere else. I always figured I was pretty darn good and knowledgeable about ranching in South Florida and the way we do things there. So one thing that intrigued me was being able to move and do that here. Uh, I said that if if I could if I could transfer what I know from South Florida to Western Kansas and learn how to ranch in a different atmosphere, different, entirely different way of ranching that I could add a lot of value to myself. I, I work for this company, this company, Next Gen Cattle is a great company and I don't ever plan on leaving, but it just adds value to what I do. Um, there are so many differences. It's, it's just unbelievable at the differences, you know, I, I get to talk about that out here with these people and with my friends at home. So it, you know, I, I moved from, from a place where we get 60 inches of rain a year um, on average uh, around where I live in South Florida from the Mockley area to a place where we get between 15 and 18 inches of rain a year. So that's, as you know, that's a drastic difference. Um, I moved from flat Palmetto Woods in Cypress country where it's, you know, underwater for several months out of the year to uh, rocky canyons and bluffs and uh, a little bit of this terrain here where I'm at is a little bit of a, a different terrain than anyone would ever think of about Kansas. People in Kansas don't even know this this part of the world is here. It's deep country. I wouldn't call it high country. It's more of a deep country. It's, it's uh, like I said, it's canyons and bluffs and deep draws and stuff like that. You, you know, you can get on top of one of these bluffs and you can see for miles and miles and miles. But, you know, people think because you can see so far, you can see cattle, but honestly, if she's right over the next little ridge, you can't see her. So I might be standing on top of a hill and not be able to see a cow that's, you know, a hundred yards from me. Uh, but there's so many differences. And then, you know, in Florida, we graze, you know, especially where I'm from Florida, we don't bail hay. We don't feed cattle in the winter other than a, maybe a liquid supplement or a tub. Mm -hmm. And here we bring cattle in. Oh gosh. This year, we pushed them a little bit longer, and we bring cattle in in December, and we feed cattle from about December to May 1, and about the 1st of May, we will go back to our summer grass, and uh, it is, it's amazing the differences, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm really enjoying the change. It's, uh, it's challenging in so many different ways, you know, I, I'm I talked to my friends in Florida here in the last week. As a matter of fact, you and I were just talking about it a few minutes ago before we went on how warm it is in Florida. And last 
last week that was 13 below zero here mm -hmm. and i still we are we're pretty much covered up in snow right now it's melting off we were we're warmed up a little bit yeah we we are warmed up to 23 degrees today so it's uh it, it's definitely different you yeah. know and the snow will melt off and that's good moisture you know i've, I've learned things about about that too you know it takes about 10 inches of snow wet snow to make one inch of rain and that you know i never knew that mm -hmm. you know, cool here yeah yeah and clean and that, that is really interesting and uh let's talk about uh, talking about the way that you are managing it and the cattle that you say the cattle stay probably on rangelands during the during the the warm months and then they come in right in the fall and winter and so you need to full feed those cattle so in order for them to make it how, how do you insert your breeding season there okay my breeding season here is different in florida you know i I'm, i believe in all fall yeah in florida mm -hmm.
stalk is left there. The stalks are a couple of feet high and they have leaves on them and there's some grain on the ground. So we put cattle on Milo stalks until about the 1st of February when we, when we start to bring those cattle in. But everything else stays in here in the yard and uh, we pour the feed to them. Yeah, and Clint, uh, on the on the pasture management standpoint, as you said, so uh, it's more like a rangeland than native, right? So they they have like a, a lot of acres for a pair, correct? Yes, here where I'm at, it, they figure about one to ten to one to twelve acres, um, and it depends on what part of the ranch I'm on. I've got some some pieces of the ranch that are a little bit of more of a rolling type hill that hold a little bit more grass and they'll be about one to ten mm -hmm. on these really rocky areas and stuff like that they'll be about one to twelve uh we are not quite like they are out further west when you go further west from here they'll get to you know one to twenty and then on out in nevada where i've been i've been out there and visited and there'll be a, a cow section <laughs> mm -hmm. thank god about that but but we're about one to ten, one to twelve, and uh, you know when we go to grass, it, as long as we have moisture, this country grows great grass, and it is all native. It, you know, you you said it, but it is all native, all native rangeland, and uh, we have no improved pastures. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, this country and some of some parts of it, you know, and I post a lot of stuff on Facebook. I I kind of get a little bit of a I don't know if you want to call it nostalgic or, or whatever, because I think about things and this country and part of it that we graze looks exactly like it did 150, 175 years ago when our people were moving across the country, you know, going west. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a place on the south end of the ranchers, there's an old stone building, and it's you know, when I look at that place, it, it, it tells me that somebody was going west and just decided to stop there. And that's where they threw things up and decided that's where they were going to homestead. And it's and the building sits right on a creek, uh, so they have water there. There's big grass in that country, so it was a place for them to graze. And to me, all that stuff is very interesting and, uh, and kind of takes you back. It's it, on some days when I'm horseback, you know, you can actually feel like you're in the old west. Mm -hmm. and, and those are all private lands, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, where I, we have we have zero lease land. Uh, all these lands are private land, privately owned lands. Yes, we don't have any BLM stuff or uh, or things like that. We are mm -hmm. all uh, where we graze is all private. Lands. Okay. And I think now uh, switching to another topic that is quite interesting that everybody likes to talk about, that is genetics, right? Cattle genetics, the difference yes. between our ear cattle and the cattle that you work over there. Right, absolutely. Um, which, you know, here at NextGen, we, we focus on a couple different things. Um, actually, we're working on another breed now. We will include Angus in our in our breeding in the next few years, but, or maybe even sooner than that. But where we're at, we are the master in Charlotte is our seed stock operation. And our seed stock operation is about three hours east of me in a place called Paxico, Kansas. And that's where our headquarters is at. We raise the master bulls and Charlotte bulls, and then of course, direct females as well. And we have a couple sales a year. So, our genetics are really big for us here. So one of the things that I've been able to do here where I'm at, and it's really fun for me, is be able to track our genetics. So on all my calves here at the ranch, we pull DNA on them before we wean calves. And I will wean those calves right here in our little grow yard. And then from our grow yard, they will go to our feed yards. And I'll take that DNA and run that and be able to track those cattle all the way to the packing plant. We have a packing plant as well. So we are able to, to track some of the stuff, which we also go out to, to outside packers as well. But so part of uh, mine and my boss, Derek Thompson, something that we kind of want to do is, is our thought process. 
process, do it this way. Purebred operations, you know, when you go to buy bulls or whatever, whatever, you know, whatever breed it is, you go look at your EPDs and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, those EPDs are built in a very confined or, you know, small atmosphere or, you know, however you want to put it, in the, in the purebred operation. And it's all done very controlled. I want to build a database with our genetics out of our our seed stock animals through our crossbred cattle, which I have all crossbred cattle here. I, I don't run purebreds here on this operation. Our purebreds are all further east. I am a cow a commercial cow calf operation, mm-hmm. but I want to build a database on how our genetics do on a commercial herd, all the way to the pack. Okay, so I'm going to take those, take those, take that DNA and run it through, track, track all of these carcasses on these cattle that we're feeding to the packer and be able to come back to our customers and say, hey, this is what these genetics will do on your kind of herd. So I have one thing that's kind of cool, and we haven't touched on it, but I have a lot of Florida cattle here. Okay, so I not only do I come to Kansas from Florida, mm-hmm. but we went back and we bought a bunch of heifers out of Florida off of off of some you know very good ranches. We bought some cattle off of Rumar Ranch, which is the Carlton Ranch. Uh, Rumar uh, Spurland cattle, which is West Carlton and Tracy Carlton. So we brought some heifers from there. Uh, we've got some heifers from the Larson Ranch. Uh, we have some peppers from the Raptor Tea Ranch, which is Mr. Jimmy Wall there outside of Seabrook. And we'll take those cattle and run our genetics across the top of them. And then we have some Red Angus cattle out of Nebraska that we run. We have some Angus type cattle that are right here from Kansas. And then I also have a set of uh, Beef Master Crossbred that came out of Nevada. So we're, we're able to run our genetics across the top of them. Take that DNA, track those cattle all the way through our process, all the way through our feeding, all the way through to the to the packer, and then bring a database back. And I can actually talk to a customer and say, hey, this is what this set of genetics is going to do on your type of cattle, whether it's Brangus cattle, which I have some Brangus cattle, or beef pasture cross cattle, or red Angus cattle, or, or red Angus beef pasture cross. And to me, that's all really interesting, and it's uh, it's kind of fun to do, honestly. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, it, it just it, it lets us market our product to a you know, a, and I won't even say to a wider a wider bunch of people, which it actually will, but it actually lets us market those cattle to our customers and be able to give them specific data on what these cattle will do all the way to the pastor. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, um, and and most of the breeding that you do over there, it's all bull breeding, right? You, you don't do AI in the commercial, correct? Actually, I do. Oh, Actually, you do. We, uh, I will AI out of some of our top genetics, mm-hmm. um, and we will AI, AI everything on the ranch. I don't actually, but I have an AI technician that does it. Okay. So we will AI everything here on the ranch with our top genetics, and then I will clean them up with bulls that are all of our genetics um, from our seed stock program. And that, you know, and then we pull the DNA back. Of course, we know we know about when our AI calves are going to be born, and then the other calves will be our cleanup calves, and then that's why we pull the DNA. So we can get specific sires on each calf. Okay. It's, uh, it's kind of a unique deal, and something that I don't think a lot of people are doing in commercial land as far as tracking their DNA through the commercial operation. And for me, it's it's really fun to be able to do and, and to be able to, to do that and actually go to a customer and say, hey, you've got a really nice set of Brankus cattle. This is what set of genetics probably will work better on your cattle. So uh, for, for me to do that is, is kind of cool and it's great marketing. Yeah. And uh, do you think that the, the AI is working well also because you have all the cattle down confined at the time that, because I think you do time in AI, right? You have a protocol and you 
and the cattle is there, you are feeding the cattle, so it makes it much easier to manage that. Yes, I think, you know, and as you know, um, get cattle bread is all about nutrition. So, and, you know, we will have our nutrition up in our cattle when it comes time, and we will, we will AI these cattle, cattle right around the 1st of June. So they're, they've been in our yard. You know, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll go to grass right before that, but they've, you know, we're going to go to smaller grass areas before we bring them back in an AI. But yes, it is a time. We do a time day out here mm -hmm. on our purebred operation. We we, uh, we check heats and stuff like that. But here here at the ranch where I'm at, I do a, a time day out, and we're able to, to. We've got a pretty doggone good breed up on our cattle with our AI this year. I'll know more when I get all of our DNA back. Mm -hmm. But I think we've done pretty well with it. And yes, it does help having them confined right here around the ranch. You know, it doesn't work well. You know, if you're spread out, you know, too yeah. big, you know, to bring cattle in as much as you have to for AI. Mm -hmm. But the way we are confined here, feeding and nutrition, and getting these cattle the way we need to, to have them set up, it, it does work well for us. Yeah. And, and Tate, um, we are we are going towards the end of our conversation, but before we finish here, uh, I would like to talk also about, um, you know, some problems. Uh, and I think it's good to make the, the people aware, right, of the different things that we face in agriculture in general, like you have been in Florida all your life and you have the hurricanes, but uh, can you please describe to us the recent uh, events that you had there in Kansas with fire and, and how traumatic that it, it is? I, th I think it's, it's probably a good experience to share as well. I think so too, uh, Joe. You know, I... I've been through a lot of things. I'm 54 years old and seen a lot of weather events and went through Hurricane, or I didn't go through it, but I went down to Miami right after Hurricane Andrew, uh, which is, you know, to date the worst thing I had seen. And then, you know, been through hurricanes right there in Southwest Florida and, you know, deep water and things like that. And then come out here and I saw, you know, we had 35 below wind chill factor last year when we were trying to calve, you know, and it was a, a one older gentleman told me he was 76 years old and never seen a winter like this, you know, like that in his life. And it was really tough. And then last summer, uh, actually at the end of May, we flooded here. We had a huge flood and uh, of course I haven't had any rain since then, but it was, it was a big flood at the time. I lived right on a creek and um, we had deep water and it, it, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. But um, and deep flowing water, which is a big thing that a lot of people don't realize where we're from, you know, in South Florida, when the water comes up, we just get, you know, we just get wet and all that. Here, it's, it's deadly when that water comes up. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, that old saying when the creek rises, uh, but it's when it when that water gets that deep and flows that hard is is deadly. It's very dangerous. And but here on December fifteenth, uh, we had well they had a hundred and thirty mile an hour winds recorded about twenty mile east of me. We had they said we were a hundred or a little over a hundred miles an hour here where I where I live. Uh, power lines went down, started fires. The fires were moving at anywhere from 60 to 70 miles an hour. Um, I was talking to a, uh, I actually talked to a few of them, a few firefighters, said they'd never seen anything like it. So the 100 mile an hour winds and fire, they said the, the head fires were 200 to 250 feet deep. So this was unexpected, of course, and it burned 400,000 acres in 24 hours. And I've never seen anything like it. And it killed thousands of cattle. Um, and these cattle would run. I, I got up next morning. We were fortunate. I will, I will say that fortunate, blessed. Um, someone, the good Lord, was looking out for us here at the ranch. We lost about 2,500 acres of grass. But, and, you know, burned down some fences and some facilities, but we were okay. I didn't lose my house. I didn't lose any cattle here on the ranch. But east of us, it, uh, last number I heard was around 4,000 head of 
Joe, the dot, uh, that fire was moving so fast and that they just couldn't get away from it. You mm-hmm. know, they can run as fast as they want to, but at 60 or 70 miles an hour moving, you know, but with that fire moving that fast, and those head fires that deep, it, it was the worst thing that I've seen in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, these cattle die just by the tons. Uh, it's pretty rough. Yeah. You know, people lost their homes and they lost their entire, you know, some of these people, I have a young intern that works for me. And his family is a long time family right here in the area. And they, you know, they ran about 115 head of cattle. Mm-hmm. They had 78 of them killed. And it, I'd never seen anything like it. These, you know, with, with these cattle and the, the cattle would run either to the end of a pasture and be crammed up against a fence and the fire would catch them or they would go into a, a draw. You know, we have mm-hmm. this, you know, we're hilly and have a lot of rocky bluffs and it's deep. And they, those cattle would run down there and that fire would just overtake them. Mm-hmm. And it, like, like I said, it's, it's the worst thing these people have, these people have been through for lack of a better phrase, these, these people have been through pure hell, mm-hmm. and it, it's pretty bad to see. So, but there are a lot of relief efforts. Mm-hmm. Um, I, all the time, there are a lot more good people in the world than bad people. Um, we want to focus on bad people a lot, but there are a lot of really good people. And every day, I live um, a little ways from a, a pretty decent sized highway, and you'll see just convoys of semis coming in with dense material and hay and feed supplies and things like that that people are just sending to these people and to help them out with what they have left here at the ranch we are uh, we built a little bit of a, a su- supply dump or if you want to call it mm-hmm. we, uh, a place where they can they can stack supplies for people and we have to pay in here now that we're sending out to people and things like that. But it's just, you know, the relief efforts have been amazed at what people have done here for, for uh, these other people. And it's all, it's all agricultural people, as mm-hmm. you know, better than anybody, because you're right in the middle of it every day. Um, the agricultural community is as good a bunch of people. It's the best bunch of people in the world, I think. And it goes across the world. It goes from where you're from to where I'm from. And, and all the way out here, the agricultural community is just a great group of people, and they always reach out and try to help each other. So this fire deal has been unbelievable. And then we went from that to 13 below zero last week, and, and I'm still covered in snow, and we're still feeding cattle, and we will keep on ranching and doing what we do. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's probably the point. Well, I, I know that's kind of a long, yeah. you know, talk about it, but, you know, I, I really can't express enough if, if the things that I've seen and the, and the goodness of people that, yeah. that we've seen in this deal. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great way to to overcome a tragedy just to have the positive out of it and all the people coming together and helping each other, like we have seen many times, right, in the agriculture community. You know, the yeah. Is, is I, you know me, I, I, I know people pretty far and wide, so I reached out to people and um, I love my Florida Cattlemen Association and the, the Florida Cattlemen Association, the Florida Cattlemen Foundation reached out big and, mm-hmm. and, and sent a lot of money out here to these people and then, and has really been, you know, and I get stuff from individuals and I, I they didn't want their names said, so I won't say their names, but, you know, people send money, you know, and things to just to help people. Mm-hmm. And it's all Florida, and they don't know these people. Mm-hmm. They, they, they've never met any human here other than me, mm-hmm. and they still reach out and they still want to help people because they understand and they understand what people go through in our industry. And the cattle industry to me is still the greatest group of people on earth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and Clint, I, I would like to really thank you again for being part of the podcast. Appreciate your. I, I always appreciate you, and I appreciate what you do. And you know, you can call me anytime. I like to run my mouth anyway, but I like.
have to talk. So um, I'm always available for you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cliff. And um, this is the end of our podcast today. And I'm Joe Vendramini.